guys and welcome back to my channel for the next installment in my history series and I am so excited to share today's story with you. Is it weird to have a favourite disease, like one disease that just fascinates you more than the rest? Because for me that's the bubonic plague. My fascination with the plague started when I was about 13 years old. I read a book called At the Sign of the Sugar Plum by Mary Hooper, which I actually think I have somewhere to show you. Where's that? Where is it? This book. This book is actually an omnibus called The Fever and the Flame, but it's actually two books in one in here. It's called At the Sign of the Sugar Plum and Petals in the Ashes, both by Mary Hooper. Um, and I, when I was about 13, I went to a talk by this author where she was basically talking to a lot of people my age about the history behind this book and it is so so accurate everything in this book is so like on point and I just remember sitting there just absolutely enraptured by this woman talking about the plague I found it fascinating so I went home I sat down and I read at the sign of the sugar plum and from there my fascination with the plague has just never really gone away now I know that the plague has been the cause of some massive epidemics throughout history in this particular video I'm going to be focusing on the great plague of London of 1665 um, because that's the particular topic that I have a load of knowledge in that's what I've always taught myself about of course I'll give you a quick general overview of the plague and the history behind it but this is mostly going to be focusing on London 1665. London as a city has got such a deep dark and gruesome history it really has hundreds and hundreds of years of stories to tell and being someone who's always lived very near London I've always gone to London very often and I've always been a bit of a nerd and always tried to find out all the history behind it so in this series you're probably going to find a lot of videos focusing on London because I just find it fascinating. If you really want a very deep in-depth look of the history and the epidemiology of the plague and really want to understand all the sciencey bits behind it I would highly highly recommend you go and listen to This Podcast Will Kill You. They did a two-part plague episode it was honestly just incredible so if you want to know all the sciencey bits I would highly recommend going and checking that out after you've watched this one of course. So we'll start briefly by talking about the Black Death, which is one of the most devastating pandemics in human history. It's been suggested by medical geneticists that all of the three big plague outbreaks actually originated in China, and the Black Death of the 1300s is no different. Um, in the 1330s in China, it's estimated that 25 million Chinese and Asian people died from the plague, and other similar epidemics. By the mid 1340s this plague had left China and travelled along the Silk Road on rats and the rats went on ships and these ships pulled into European ports and in January 1348 there was an outbreak in Pisa in Italy which was the first outbreak in Europe of the plague and this quickly spread northwest across Europe. It was the first outbreak in Europe of its kind and it's estimated that it killed 30 to 60 percent of Europe's population at the time. That's at least one in three people. All in all I saw that the plague reduced the world's population from 450 million to 350 million by the 14th century. That's 100 million people wiped off the planet by the plague and it took the world another 200 years to recover to its previous level and this is why I think I find history so important. If these huge amounts of people hadn't died from this disease in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s then the world as we know it today would be entirely different. It's the butterfly effect. If the plague hadn't had this effect on the population what people wouldn't have been born? Maybe we wouldn't have had Einstein, we wouldn't have had Stephen Hawking, we wouldn't have had these amazing minds that have sculpted the world as we know it today. But at the same time maybe the plague has changed the course of the world so much that maybe at this time we would already have the cure for cancer. We would know how to fix climate change and maybe we would never even be suffering with climate change. Just the butterfly effect of this amount of the population dying from a single disease is incredible, it's impossible to imagine. Everything in our history changes everything about the future, which is obviously just a very obvious statement to make, but that's why I find it so important to learn about. Now the specific type of plague we're going to be talking about in this video is shock horror, the bubonic plague, which is the most common form of the disease, and it's caused by a bacterial strain called Yersinia pestis. I'm going to put that on screen in case I'm saying it wrong. 
Um, now this does differ the bubonic plague from the pneumonic plague, which is airborne and highly, highly contagious. The pneumonic plague spreads like wildfire. Once it's in the air, once somebody has airborne plague, that's kind of it. When I say the word bubonic plague, the first thing that might pop to your head is the thought of the buboes, which gives the bubonic plague its name. They're lumps generally found in the armpits, groin and neck regions. They're large inflamed lymph nodes which are very sore and very tender to the touch and they're basically caused as the plague infects your lymphatic system. Now bubonic plague generally has an incubation period of two to six days meaning that from infection to showing first symptoms of the disease it can take two to six days and the symptoms come on very suddenly and very, very quickly. Now with bubonic plague, you don't always get the very painful buboes. The disease also comes along with fever and chills, headaches, muscle pain, weakness and seizures, especially when it gets to your brain. Untreated, the plague can reach your blood and then it becomes septicemic plague, the third of the three types of plague. Once the infection reaches the blood, it's not uncommon for a person to start suffering with gangrene in their extremities. An untreated person with the plague will usually die within 10 days and I've seen death rates going from 80% to 95%. Basically if you get the plague you're more likely to die than survive if you remain untreated. Nowadays plague can be treated with antibiotics if you have access to them but obviously back in 1665 antibiotics didn't exist. And they have actually experimented with vaccines for plague, but it hasn't really proven to be particularly useful at all. And the plague is still very much around today. You don't really see it much in the Western world, but in very rural parts of Africa, um, it's still pretty common. There's actually a very publicized breakout quite recently in Madagascar. Generally though, it occurs in less than 5,000 people a year worldwide. And if treated with antibiotics, it's generally very survivable nowadays. Um, from 2010 to 2015, there were 584 reported deaths from the plague worldwide. And that number is kind of incredible. When you look back at 1665 in London, where the official records show that 68,596 people died from the plague. And that's just in London. And this number is thought to be at least 30,000 less than the true number. Researchers nowadays think that over 100,000 people in London died from the plague in 1665, and that's at least 15% of the population. This was the worst outbreak of plague that had been in England since the 1300s, since the Black Death. Although it was common knowledge in London that there was a small outbreak of plague every 20 years. So no one was really shocked when in 1665, a few people started to get the plague, but it would go on to be worse than they could ever have imagined. The earliest cases of this outbreak were reported in the spring of 1665 in a parish just outside of London called St Giles in the Fields. And the death rate began to rise throughout the summer months, peaking in August and September before slowly dying off. Now St Giles in the Fields was just outside of the city walls of London. And when I talk about the city wall, I'm literally referring to a big wall that was around the city of London. Um, this was a defensive wall first built by the Romans around what was the city of London at the time. Um, and this defined the boundaries of London until around the 1500s. But as the city began to grow, it actually grew outside of the wall. So although St Giles in the Fields was outside of the walls of London, it was still part of London, if that makes sense. But the majority of the city of London was still within the walls and this wall meant that you had specific entry gates in and out of the city. You couldn't just wander in and out wherever you wanted. You had to go to these specific gates. And this city wall was a double-edged sword when it came to the plague because it meant that they could mostly contain the disease within the city walls. Although it started outside, it quickly came into the city and it meant they could kind of control where the diseased people went. But these walls also meant that the healthy people were trapped in with the sick. By 1665, London city was overpopulated. The poor slept in crowded rooms with dirt floors, hence the saying, dirt poor. The streets were incredibly, incredibly narrow. 
the tops of buildings were so close together that barely any sun could peek through and the sun just didn't ever really reach the cobbled streets below. The sewage would run down the streets because of the lack of a sewage system and this sewage would sometimes be inches deep, both human and animal waste. And there was this constant thick smog over the city from all of the houses burning coal and all of the factories just pumping out all of this smoke. And the hot summers meant that they would sometimes go weeks with no rain whatsoever to wash the sewage away. The entire city literally stank. People would walk around with handkerchiefs held to their nose to stop the stink. Um, the city employed people called rakers who would basically go around and rake the streets for sewage and they would take the sewage outside of the city walls. But it was a never ending job, they could never get all of the sewage and they mostly just focus around the areas where the rich people lived because the rich people don't want to be around the sewage but who really cares about the poor people? And so all in all, London was just gross. There was this huge disparity though between the rich and the poor in London in the 1600s. The rich tended to be really rich and the poor tended to be really, really poor. The better off would be carried around by the poor in sedan chairs to avoid having to step in the filth in the streets and whilst the poor had to work really really hard to keep any kind of food on the table which is mostly just bread and water the rich saw this whole other side of london which was a life of grand grand houses they'd buy their wares and these gorgeous clothes at the markets they'd go to the very fashionable royal exchange they'd attend plays in london's playhouses they'd mingle with members of the royal court the rich were rich, the poor were poor. There was of course the middle class as well, the people who would run the businesses, the people who would open the shops and sell their wares at the markets, but they lived closer to the poor than the rich. And the city as well was busy. In London today, there are traffic jams, but in 1665, there were also traffic jams and cars didn't even exist. There was just so many people, horses, carriages, sedan cars, people pulling carts, that parts of the city would literally be gridlocked just with people. It was so, so busy all the time. Which isn't exactly ideal when a disease is about to break out. Now, medical care in the 1600s was pretty much ruled by apothecaries. There was no NHS in those days. It was very difficult to differentiate the actual doctors from what were called the quacks. And even the respectable doctors in these times were entirely deficient in medical knowledge. They actually knew nothing whatsoever by today's standards. The only difference between the actual doctors and the quacks, whether they believed they were actually helping or not. The quacks were just there to rip people off. The actual doctors thought that at least they were doing something to help. Neither of them really helped in the end. Now, interestingly, it was actually widely believed that planets ruled the people and therefore medical treatments often relied on somebody's astrology. And I find that fascinating when you look at sort of the world today and so many people today are getting back into astrology. A lot of people are going back to these mindsets that astrology does control people. And that was exactly the kind of mindset they had back in the 1600s. Maybe they were onto something, maybe they weren't. I don't really know enough about it to say anything. Um, now, in apothecaries, which were mostly ruled by astrology, um, herbs and flowers were often used to treat illness because most people couldn't afford an actual doctor. They would go to the apothecaries instead. Knowledge of disease was really, really poor. Pretty much everything was just treated with herbs and flowers. And most people believe that illness was caused by miasma, which is basically, they believe that illness was transferred through the air by bad smells. They're not crazy far off with miasma theory. I mean, airborne diseases do very much exist and germs do travel via the air, um, but not necessarily through bad smells. But this often meant that people thought if they could protect themselves from the smells, they wouldn't get ill, which of course wasn't the case. Now, people believe that the first sign that a plague was upon them came towards the end of 1664, when people saw a flaming comet flying across the sky. In a world of God-fearing people, in a very, very Christian England, this was taken as a sign of God's wrath on the sinners. And many people believe when they saw this comet that something bad was around the corner, and I mean, they were right. Um, there were also rumours of people seeing an angel with a scythe 
in the clouds before the outbreak took hold, which according to the people was another sure sign that God was mad at them. The first officially recorded death from the plague, like I said, occurred in April 1665 in the parish of St Giles in the Fields. And the disease starts slowly at first, but by May 43 people had died and the disease slowly spreads to neighbouring parishes. It spreads to St Clement's Danes, St Andrews, Holborn and St Mary's Woolchurch Hall. All of these were outside of the city walls, apart from St Mary Woolchurch Hall, which was within the city walls, the first sign of the disease inside the walls. And by June, people began to realise this plague was more serious than they'd given credit. 6,137 people died in June. That's 43 people had died at the beginning of May. By the end of June, over 6,000. Now there's no census at the time, so we can't say for certain how many people lived in London, but it's thought that it would be around 400,000 people living in London and the out parishes by the time the plague struck. Um, now, the number of deaths from the plague were actually recorded each week in the Bills of Mortality, which listed the total number of deaths in each single parish, and whether the death was by plague or something else. And the criers would go into the streets each week and announce the number of deaths. However, there was no actual duty for the public to report the death of any family member, any loved ones, to the authorities. People would die and usually be taken to the local church to be buried and that was pretty much it. But of course there needed to be a way to keep track of how many people were dying. So the parishes appoint searchers of the dead and it was the searchers duty to go and inspect fresh corpses and determine the causes of death. But these searchers weren't medically educated or just educated at all. They were usually old women widows whose husbands had died and they required money so they're employed by the parishes to literally walk around holding a white cane so people knew who they were and they just have to look at bodies and decide if they died by the plague or not and because they're doing this job for money they wouldn't exactly be opposed to taking bribes and lying about a person's cause of death and um, the numbers the searchers provided were often inaccurate for many reasons one, they were uneducated, so they had no idea really what they were doing. Two, they worked with the church, meaning that if somebody didn't notify a death to the local church, the searchers wouldn't be notified. Um, and there were also people of different religions in 1665. It wasn't just Christians in the city at the time. And three, like I said, they were open to bribes. Um, for reasons I'll talk about shortly and for other obvious reasons, the families didn't want the word to get out if their loved one had died of the plague. And so they would bribe the searchers to lie about the cause of death. They'd often put it down as consumption or fever instead. And for these reasons, it's thought that the numbers in the bills of mortality are a lot lower than they should have been. As the plague spread, the Lord Mayor issued a proclamation that all householders were now responsible for cleaning out the front of their houses. They had to get rid of their own sewage, basically. And by July, the rich started to leave the city, including King Charles II and his court. Now, the public had generally thought of themselves as safe as long as the king was in the city. I mean, it can't be that dangerous if the king is still around. Um, so when the king left, this sense of hysteria started. Um, the king first goes to Isleworth, just outside the city walls, then he ends up going to Hampton Court, and then Salisbury, he's just going further and further out. And the further the king goes from London, the more people are panicking. And all of the rich followed the king, including all the lawyers and the doctors, which is just fantastic. And the Lord Mayor, however, did stay to enforce the King's orders. And the King's orders were public prayers and days of confession and fasting. Every person had to attend church at least once a week and always on a Wednesday. And they had to beg for God's mercy. A closure of all public places was announced. Nobody was to attend the markets or the playhouses or the coffee houses which is another thing that prompted the rich to leave because they had no reason to now stay in the city. There was to be no large gatherings of people of any kind, including funerals. Funerals were not allowed. However, church services were okay, apparently. Church bells would ring with each death in a parish and soon the bells were non-stop. 
There were fires in the street to purify the air, which just further added to the smog. Um, it was widely thought that cats and dogs were spreading the disease, and so all cats and dogs were caught on the street and killed, thrown onto a cart. And these cart drivers were paid two pence per cat or dog that they killed. So they'd often break into people's houses and literally rip their pets from them. Um, it's estimated that 200 to 400,000 cats and dogs were killed during this hunt. Houses were put under quarantine if somebody in a household caught the plague. The occupants would be shut up in the house for 40 days and 40 nights to see through the disease and prevent the spreading. The windows would be barred, the front door would be chained up and it would have a big red X painted across it with the words, Lord have mercy on us. A watchman would be appointed to sit outside the front of the door and make sure the family are getting everything they needed, buy them provisions. Um, quarantine is a good idea in theory, like somebody's got a disease, make sure they can't spread it to anyone else. But in reality, you're locking perfectly healthy people in with diseased people for 40 days. They're going to catch it, and if they don't catch the disease, they're probably going to end up dying just from starvation or dehydration because the watchmen wouldn't actually bother looking after the people in the house. They'd take the money they were given for provisions and they'd go and buy alcohol. Imagine there's a household with parents and young children. If the parents die first and these young children are left to fend for themselves, they're going to die. There were many pest houses across London, a place where infected or sick people would usually go to be quarantined, but it soon became clear that the pest houses were just oversubscribed, they couldn't take any more people, and so at this point they started to quarantine people in their own houses. And once an entire family household had succumbed to the plague, the house would be opened, the bodies would be removed, and a white cross would replace the red cross on the door, which would signify a modified quarantine. The house would be fumigated and it would be 20 more days before anybody else was allowed to move in. Nobody was allowed in or out the city walls without what was called a certificate of health, which was borderline impossible to get hold of. These certificate of health would have to be signed by the Lord Mayor himself and the person would have to be seen by a doctor and confirmed that this person was healthy. But the problem is that you could only get this signed by the Lord Mayor if A, you had money and B, all of the doctors were leaving the city. There were no doctors to sign these certificates. So the rich did manage to leave, leaving the poor to suffer. And the poor people left in the city would turn to a number of remedies to fend off the plague. Some people believed that chewing on nutmeg or rosemary or cloves would stave it off, or holding a gold coin in your mouth, or holding a snail without a shell in your mouth. They would hold posy flowers by their nose, probably initially to fend off the smell of the streets, but then also because they believed in the miasma theory, they thought if they could only smell the flowers, they wouldn't get sick. Street peddlers started to sell talismans such as rabbit feet, pieces of paper with the word abracadabra written on it in a special sort of order, and people would smoke tobacco constantly, and it would later be said that no single London tobacconist had died from the plague. And that's reported quite widely, whether that's true or not, I can't tell you. The dead collectors would smoke tobacco as they drove their carts through the street. They would drive their carts shouting, bring out your dead. They would use these crooks to wrangle the dead bodies as their loved ones would have to drag them out the front of the house and they would throw them on top of a cart, usually on top of a pile of dead bodies that's already there. There was no regard for the dead, there were just too many of them now to actually have any regard for it. At first the dead carts would only come at night, taking the bodies in secret, but eventually so many people were dying they had to actually do extra rounds during the day. Imagine being in your home, in your room, and hearing the cries of, bring out your dead. So many people were dying that they would just stack up dead bodies against the walls ready for the dead carts to come around. Imagine walking the streets and just seeing stacks and stacks of dead bodies. That became normal. And you've probably heard of plague pits as well. As the plague took hold, the churches and the graveyards became overwhelmed. They literally couldn't take any more bodies. Grave diggers couldn't keep up with the demand. And so the authorities decided to start digging these huge pits near the churchyards. They would just simply release all of the dead bodies and roll down into this ditch while the grave diggers are still digging the rest of the pit at the other end. Some of these pits would house hundreds, if not 
thousands of dead bodies at any time and once it was full the earth would just be piled back on top in these big big mounds. Over the years London has simply just been built on top of these plague pits. If you ever visit the city know that at some point whilst you're wandering around you're probably walking on top of a plague pit. The doctors left in the city, mostly apothecaries, did their best to try and help in any way they could, but many of them had no medical training whatsoever. You've probably heard of the term plague doctor, or if not, you've at least seen the haunting images of a plague doctor without even realising it. As I mentioned before, most doctors in London subscribe to the theory of miasma, that contagion was spread through foul smelling air and therefore a special costume was devised for doctors to wear. They believed that these smelly vapours could catch in the fibres of normal clothing and transmit disease. Um, this special plague outfit consisted of a waxed leather coat, leggings, boots and gloves. This suit was then coated in suet, which is white animal fat, and this was designed to repel bodily fluids. They wore black hats to signify that they were a doctor and they carried this long wooden stick with them to communicate and to examine patients and also to just hit the sick and fend them away. They would wear this mask with a beak and they'd stuff herbs and spices such as camphor, mint, cloves and myrrh into the beak to basically ward off all of these horrible smells. Um, they also wore these round goggles it all sounds like it probably should work, like it's not that far from today's quarantine suit. But the only problem is that the doctors would poke holes in the masks so they could breathe and therefore they would catch the disease. The doctors had very questionable practices by today's standards and in hindsight we can probably say that the doctors actually spread the disease more than helped fight it. The doctors would cover the buboes in human excrement, human faeces, to prevent further infection, which obviously had the opposite effect, and they would lance the buboes to drain the pus, which would mean it would spread even further. And not only did it spread the infection further, it would usually significantly advance the death. But to be honest, it's probably a small mercy that they died quicker rather than slower. Of course, the plague wasn't just contained in London and it did spread across the entire country. But London had it particularly bad because of the amount of people in such a confined space. Because of the city walls, nobody could escape, everyone got ill. It was always going to spread. Other places that suffer quite badly are York and I think Southampton and Northampton as well. As the summer came to an end, the plague started to slow down. It peaked in August and September, when over 7,000 people were reported to be dying every single week. That's 28,000 people at least dying in August alone. But luckily, it was a very, very cold winter and the disease began to die off. By February of 1666, it was considered safe for the king and his court to return to London. And with that, the rest of the rich followed. Um, so although there was a lot less plague, the plague did actually continue. There were reported cases until the summer of 1666, it was just much slower. The number of deaths vary from source to source. The official numbers are 68,000 and the unofficial number is believed to be above 100,000 at least a fifth of London's population at the time, if not more. The population of England in 1650 was approximately 5.25 million and it declined to 4.9 million by 1680. So a huge amount of the population was killed. It's widely believed that the Great Fire of London is what destroyed the plague, killing the rats that brought the plague with them. However, in actuality, it seems like the plague was all but gone by the time the Great Fire of London started anyway. It's just kind of an urban legend. I do intend to do a whole video on the Great Fire of London. It will probably be the next history video that I do because I feel like it follows on nicely from this. But I just want to mention it quickly here for people who might not know what it is. Um, so the Great Fire of London destroyed a huge amount of London within the city walls, taking most buildings down with it. The Great Plague of London in 1665 was the last big plague to ever hit the city. We've never seen anything like it since then. And it's probably because the Great Fire of London 
burnt down most of the city and so they had to rebuild and when they rebuilt they built wider streets better housing no more open sewers the wooden buildings and these overhanging gables which would block out the sunlight were abolished they weren't allowed anymore so all in all london just became a healthier city to live in after the Great Fire of London. But the Great Fire of London did also destroy a huge amount of records of the plague, which is probably why the numbers are a bit all over the place today, as well as everything else, all of the information about it. For example, we don't actually have any records of how many people contracted the disease and survived it. For all we know, pretty much everyone that caught the plague died of it in 1665, because we just don't have those records. Back in 1665, they believed that the plague was spread through miasma. Nowadays, we know that it was spread via the rats or the fleas on the rats. These rats are most likely come over on a ship from the Netherlands where the plague was rife. Now, like I said, it was caused by the Yersinia pestis bacteria, which had been suspected for a really, really long time. Scientists have kind of thought for a long time that this is what caused it, but they didn't actually confirm this until 2016, so really, really recently, which I didn't actually know. In 2016, archaeologists excavated a plague pit that was discovered when they were building the new crossrail in London at Liverpool Street. So the scientists examined these skeletons and they found the DNA of Yersinia pestis on these skeletons. The bubonic plague was a vector-borne disease. The bubonic plague couldn't be spread through infection from person to person. The pneumonic plague could be. But the bubonic plague was spread when the rats would die and the fleas would look for new hosts and they'd jump onto humans, they'd bite them and infect them with the bacteria. This bacteria would congregate mostly in the lymphatic system, in the lymph nodes, and create the buboes. Once the bacteria reached the lungs and it became pneumonic plague, that's when it became airborne, and that's when it became very, very contagious. So it was caused by the fleas on the rats. The city really didn't help itself when it killed all of the cats and dogs, possibly the only thing keeping London's rat population at bay. The plague has influenced so much of life today as we know it. Even little things like the song Ringer Ringer Roses, that is a song about the plague. It ends with the line, all fall down. Well, in 1665, that ended all fall down dead. The pocket full of poses refers to the flowers that people would keep on them at all times to ward off the smells. And when it says a tissue, a tissue, the rumour has it that all plague victims before they died would have a very bad sneezing fit and then they'd just die. All in all, the impact that the bubonic plague would have had on London at the time was astronomical. A city losing that amount of its population was really, really hard to rebuild. The butterfly effect this had on life as we know it today is just unimaginable. And then came along the Great Fire of London, which I will save for the next video. Um, thank you so much for watching, guys. I really enjoyed telling you all about the Great Plague of London. I find it so, so fascinating. Let me know down below, what's your favourite disease? I want to know. I'm intrigued. Do you have a favourite disease? Maybe you're a normal person and don't have a favourite disease. Um, also, go and listen to this podcast will kill you. It will blow your mind. Um, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and maybe check out my Patreon and my pin store links down below. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Bye.